Amen. First Church, let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. Let's do that real big. So cool to be in the house of God on this Sunday morning. This is part four of our sermon series for the month of January, I Love My Church. Something happened a few days ago, probably eight or nine days ago now, that was just incredible for me personally, and I think you're going to love this as well. I was sitting at my desk, and the phone rang, and I knew that people who would normally answer the phone were not at their desk, and so I went ahead and picked it up, and I'm glad I did. There was, uh, on the other end of the phone was a teacher from the school that is almost right across the street here, Cumberland Elementary School. And she asked to speak to someone who could help with our humanitarian outreach. And I, I said, well, that person's not here right now, but maybe I could help you. Let, tell me what you need, and, and I'll see if I can help you. And she said, well, we have a, a few students in our school, about 50, who come to school every Monday morning hungry because over the weekend they didn't have anything to eat. Here at the school, we feed them lunch and we feed them breakfast, and so they get food during the week. But a lot of these children are from broken homes, and the parents are working. It's not that they don't love their kids, but they're working, and there's financial difficulty. And so they're unable to provide for them sometimes on the weekend, and these kids come to school hungry, and it's hard for us to do our job to teach them when they're hungry. And so what we're looking for is someone that can help us put a few things in their backpack on Friday afternoon when they go home, things that children, because these are kindergartners through fifth grade, things that children can prepare for themselves. So like the microwavable mac and cheese where you just add water and put it in the microwave for a few minutes, or ramen noodles or Pop-Tarts, things that they can provide for themselves to eat. We're looking for somebody to help us with that. And I said, well, you know, tell me a little bit more about what you have in mind because we definitely want to help you. And she said, well, what we're looking for was that every Friday, we would have 50 different bags that we could just put in the back of each one of these backpacks, and these kids could go home, and they'll be able to eat. And I said, we're going to partner with you, and every Friday, First Church is going to make sure that you have the 50 bags you need to put in those children's bags, and when they come to school on Monday morning, they will have been fed throughout the weekend. I love First Church. I love our church. I love our church, and so here's how you can help. Here's how you can be a part of it. There's two ways. Someone has already asked me. They said, I want to contribute to that. I want to help pay for that. And the first way you can contribute to that is through our mission. Our missions is anything outside of this church. Our missions goes to the Philippines. It goes to Guatemala, but it also goes to do things in the community like that. And so if you want to contribute to that, just contribute to our missions, and you'll help make that possible. The second way you can help is on the first Saturday of every month, we do first Saturday server. We come together, we prepare 100 lunches for homeless in our community. We prepare things for the hospital. We prepare things for nursing homes. We do this every month. And so every, starting this first Saturday, which will be Saturday, February 1st, we will be preparing 200 bags. So every Friday, the month of February, we'll do it again the month of March. Every Friday in the month of March, those children will have food to go throughout the weekend. And we're going to do this as long as we can. We're not going to just do it for February, March. We're going to do it all year. We'll do it next year. As long as there are children in that school who are hungry, who need to be taken care of, First Church is going to step up and help make sure they're taken care of. I think that's an incredible thing. And so mark your calendars. If you keep your calendar on your digital phone, whatever it is that you're using, Go ahead and post it on there. First Saturday serve, 8 a.m. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be a part of making that happen. Thank you so much to all of you who make that happen. And we're in this sermon series about loving our church, why we love our church and what makes it incredible. Several, several months ago, I guess now, I happened to be reading an article about the James Webb Telescope, and they'll put a picture of that on the screen. And this telescope is an amazing thing that has allowed scientists and observers to, to see galaxies that we didn't know exist and to see the formation of stars and to see a kaleidoscope of colors that no person has ever seen before. And it's allowed us to do some incredible things. And one of the things that it's allowed us to do 
is to study the formation of planets. It's a, kind of a ridiculously just overwhelming thought, the idea that we could watch planets being developed. And in this article, there was a statement that just jumped out at me. And when, when you see this statement, you'll understand why, why it jumped out at me. And they put it on the screen. Cosmic dust is essential to the function of the universe. It shelters forming stars, the so stars that are in the process of being developed. It becomes part of planets. And it can contain the organic compounds that lead to life as we know it. And the final words of that statement are, dust is us. We are dust. Leah Ramsey, in this article, she made the statement that you and I are dust. That's all we are. This is the organic compounds that lead to life as we know it. We're nothing more than dirt. And so one of the things that I love about First Church is that you and I are completely aware that we really are nothing more than dirt. Now that sounds a little bit offensive, but this statement reminds me of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. The organic compound that they say that the planets are developed from and that all of dust leads to life is right there in our Bible. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils and man became a living person. This is an incredible statement because... You and I, we really don't like dirt. We, we don't like dirt at all. And, and, and so dirt is not really something we think about it. But let's be honest with each other. It's the one thing that we all have in common. You are dirt and I am dirt. And God didn't go to any celestial thing to, to try and, and get us to uh, be what we are. But he went to dirt. That's what he went to. And so in Genesis chapter Four, I believe it is, or chapter 3, it makes the statement that we will return to dust. You and I will return to the dirt of the earth. And we really don't like that. In fact, when we think about dirt, dirt is very negative to us. We don't like dirt. In fact, when we think about people that we don't like, we, we would say things like they're worse than dirt or they're less than dirt. And we don't like dirt. But let's just be honest, we are all dirt today. In fact, not only do we not like dirt, we do a lot to try and make our own dirt look better. We buy nice clothes to cover up our dirt. And then we do things to our dirt to make it look better. We get dirt tucks and dirt lifts. And we exfoliate our dirt. We get dirt manicures and dirt pedicures. And we go on diets to try to make us less dirt. And so for those of you who are tall, you're just more dirt than the rest of us. We don't like our dirt because we know that when, when we touch dirt, dirt touches us back. And so we don't like dirt. Dirt is just something that we're, we, we just don't want to be a part of. And, and so when we see dirt and we think of dirt, dirt is just something we're always trying to cleanse our home from the dust that is in our home. And yet in reality, that's what we are. Now here's why that's important is because if you don't remember that you are dirt, then there comes some point in time in your life where you begin to think that you are better than other people. But as Genesis 3 says, we came from the dirt and we will return to the dirt. And that's really what we are. We're dirt. And it's important that we remember this. And one of the things I love about First Church is this isn't a haughty, arrogant church that is afraid of people who are a little bit dirty. But we are a church who understands that we were dirty and that we're still dirt. And so because of that, we love people who are dirty. Yeah. And even though as humans, we don't like dirt and we don't want to be around things that are dirty and we want to stay away from that, protect ourselves from that. We know when we touch dirt, dirt, dirt touches us back. We understand that God doesn't see dirt like we do. God doesn't see dirt like you and I see dirty. In fact, quite the contrary, God sees dirt and he sees potential. And so what was so incredible about this article is, is that the writer said that, that this James Webb telescope studying 
all of the formation of the stars is that we realize that dust is the organic compound from which all the planets are made. And so when you see dirt and when I see dirt, we want to cleanse our hands of that. Because after all, aren't we supposed to be holy? We serve a holy God. We're not supposed to be holy. We want to cleanse our hands, but God doesn't see that. What God sees is potential. And so when you see the pictures from James Webb Telescope, you see all that they're seeing, that, that dust glowing. And what most people see is just dust. What God sees is potential. He sees potential for life. He sees potential for greatness. And even though God is incredible, He's not intimidated by the insignificant. Even though God is awesome and amazing, He isn't worried about the awful. And even though God is great, it doesn't bother Him that dirt is what you and I I would run from in fact God sees that and he says I think I can do something special with that I can do something special with that and so what does God do God becomes dirt like us so we can become holy like him this is the story of Christmas just a few weeks ago we celebrated Christmas and and this is the story of Christmas that God became dirt like us the God of heaven who's sitting on the throne of heaven decides to step down from his throne and step across the chasm of sin that had separated divinity from humanity. God, that chasm that had separated divine from dirt. And he steps across that and he becomes like you and me. And he doesn't become like you and me so that he can become more dirty. He becomes like you and me so that he can help us to become holy. Now, one of the things that I hope this church is, I hope this is a holy church, but I hope it's a holy church that always has dirty hands, that always remembers that we really have nothing outside of the grace of God. And so you and I, we need to be comfortable with dirt because God is comfortable with dirt. And the reason that you and I need to be comfortable with dirt is simply the reality that without God, you and I are nothing and we can have nothing and we can do nothing. I can't even stand on this platform today and preach outside of the grace of God. I know my own dirt. I know my dirt very well. And sometimes my dirt is more obvious. I do things I wish I hadn't done. And I say things and I get a bad attitude. And I think things and that dirt rears its ugly head and I want to be holy but in being holy we have to always remember that we are dirt what would a perfect church look like to you like if you could say what a perfect church what, what would a great church let me phrase it that way what would a great church look like different people have different ideas some people would say well a great church is a church that everybody is faithful and they always show up every Sunday. They always show up. And a great church is a church where all the people there, they're holy people. They're very holy. They look holy. They act holy. They talk holy. They sound holy. And a great church would be a church where everybody's reading their Bible. They're on a one year Bible program and every year they read through their Bible. A great church would be a church where everybody shows up for all the prayer meetings. That's, if you're really doing a good job as your pastor, that's what your church would look like. It would, in fact, everybody would show up on Sunday and they would all look good. That would be a good church. That would be a great church. One Sunday morning when I was standing outside greeting a guest who had come to our church, came to me and let me know he was offended because there were people here who weren't dressed appropriately for church. And I, I said to him, I'm sorry that you're offended, but... I need you to do me a favor. Will you show me that Bible verse? He said, well, I don't know where it is, but I know it's in there. And I said, well, please find it and send me an email. And when I get your email, I will take it to the church and let them know. I'm still waiting on that email because it's not in there. Because a great church isn't a church where everybody shows up and they're all holy and spiritual. In fact, I would tell you, if your church... If everybody looks right, talks right, acts right, then you're not doing your job. It means there's no baby. Because where there are babies, there are dirty diapers. Dirt. Where there's babies, there are dirty diapers and things happen. And, and I will, I'll say this to you that 
a good church will have those holy people in it. And thank God for the people who show up for the prayer meetings. And thank God for the people who are always faithful. And thank God for the people who are looking right. But a good church, a great church will also have those people in it that don't look just right, don't act just right, don't smell just right, don't talk just right, don't do just right. That's what a good church is. And so here's what I want to say to you today. If you're here and you're feeling a little bit dirty, you are home. Welcome home. This is where you belong. And I'll, let me just stretch that a little bit further. I think a great church is also a church that has people in it that may be coming in with alcohol in their breath, maybe have some marijuana stashed in the front pocket. They may not in any way, shape, or form. They may use some words that you would consider off color. Why do they keep coming? Because God's comfortable with dirt. And I want to be comfortable with dirt. And I don't want to ever, I don't want this church to ever be at a place where we can be okay with everybody looking right and, and being right. I don't want to ever be that church. I always want to be a church that says we understand where we came from. And since we know where we came from, and since we also know that we're not always in the top 10 or top 20% of the church, sometimes we have our bad days and we may be the dirtiest among us because we know that. We just open up our arms and say, we love you and we're going to keep loving you because we know we're dirt and we know that God is comfortable with dirt. In fact, God's so comfortable with dirt. There's a unique deal in Numbers chapter 5, or at least I, I think it's pretty cool. I tried to share it with somebody and they looked at me like I was strange. And so let me try it with y'all. There's a law of jealousy in Numbers chapter 5. Where when a person is accused of sin, a spouse is accused of sin, they bring him to the priest. And the priest tells them. The Bible actually says this, that the priest will take holy water, calls it holy water, and that he will go and get dirt from the tabernacle floor. He'll get dust. There's dirt in the house of God. And he'll mix the dust with the holy water. And the person who's been accused will drink that water. And then when they drink the water, if they're innocent, nothing will happen. But if they're guilty, their stomach will swell and they'll have pains in their stomach. Just a little bit of pain for a little bit of time. See, God's not going to allow you just to stay dirty. The whole story here is that God brings us to a place where, where when we get comfortable with our dirt, that he brings us to a place of pain. And so it's not this message of just grace, 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 grace. You can do whatever you want and be as dirty as you want to be. No. God's comfortable with dirt. But his comfort with dirt is that he wants to breathe life into it. And he wants to change us. And all of this life and this earth, I'm always going to be made with dirt. But there's coming a day where I will be glorified. And this body will be transformed and I will be, receive a glorified body and I'll no longer be made of dirt. But as long as I'm in this, there will be times where God allows there to be pain in my life. Where he'll take a little bit of the dirt from the house of God and mix it with the holy water and allow there to be some pain in my life to bring me back to a place. He's never going to be, he's never going to walk away from the people who are dirty. John chapter 8 verse 3. This is a beautiful story. Jesus is teaching. And as he's teaching, these religious leaders come to Jesus with a woman that they've caught in the act of adultery. It's a hilarious story because they don't bring the guy. They just bring the woman. He must have been a friend of theirs. We caught this woman. and They put her in front of Jesus and in front of the crowd. And they say, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And then in verse 5, Jesus looks at them. He, or they, they, ask, they look at Jesus and they say, the law says, stone her. What do you say? In verse 6, it says they were trying to trap him to say in something they could use against him. But Jesus stoops down and he begins to write in the dust. Jesus bows down into the dust of the earth and he begins to write in the dust in front of the person, the woman, 
that they said was dirt. And he begins to write. And what does he write in the dust? It doesn't say. I like to imagine that he's, he's writing all their sins, like everything they did. And he's looking up there, and he's writing down that man's mistress. And he's looking over here at this guy, and he's writing down the woman that he was unfaithful with. And, and he keeps writing it down. And so they keep demanding an answer. And as Jesus stood up, he says, okay, you can stone her, but only let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And there was only one person standing there, actually kneeling there in the dirt, who had never sinned. And verse 8 says, he stooped down again and began to write in the dust again. And when the accusers heard this, they began to walk away, beginning from the oldest, until Jesus was the only one standing there with the woman. And so Jesus stands up and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, I don't have any. And he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. It's an incredible story of God getting down in the dirt. John chapter 9, verse 6 says, this is another story. It says that Jesus spit in the ground. Imagine this. Jesus spits in the ground. If you and I spit, it spit. <laughs> but when Jesus spits, it's holy water. And he makes mud with the saliva. I'm disgusted by this. I'm revolted by this. I think that's his intention. I think he wants you to be disgusted by this. Because if you try to do this to me, <laughs> but the blind man doesn't know what's happening, he doesn't see it coming, and so, he, he puts mud in the guy's eye, he puts dirt in his eye. And he tells them, I want you to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sin. And so the man went and washed. Here, here's my hope, my prayer for us as a church. God, make us whole. But let our hands stay dirty. God, make us holy. But let our hands stay dirty. My love for this church, one of the things I love about this church, is I'm not perfect and you're not perfect. And there's not one single person among us that has ever forgotten that. And we're not the church that says we don't want you to come here. And if you do come here, you have to dress a certain way and you have to act a certain way. We're the exact opposite. We're the church that says, hey, our doors are open for you. And not only are our doors open for you, we're not going to just stay in the house of God, but we're going to come to you and we're going to help you. We're, you're welcome to come here and we're going to come to you. We want to be that kind of church. And so one of the things that I love about First Church is we're a church that desires to please God and we want to be holy like God. But we're also a church that desires to please God in the sense that we're still going to keep our hands dirty and never be too good for anyone in this community. It doesn't matter how far they have gone. They are are still loved by God and God is comfortable with them and as long as God is comfortable with them we will be comfortable with them and so let me let me close with this thought some of you here today you feel like that you're probably a little bit dirtier than the rest of it here's what I want you to know is we've all felt that way. we've all felt that way that we just don't deserve anything and I don't know where you are and how dirty you may feel and why you feel dirty. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus is comfortable with you being here today. And he doesn't want to leave us in our state that we are. He wants to change us. But his message to me and his message to you and to anyone is I will get down in the dust and I will kneel down in the dirt and I will breathe life into you and so if you are one of those people who just feels like you're too dirty for anyone to love and too dirty for God to help my answer to you is God made all of this out of the dust of the earth all of it comes from him making breathing life in the dust of the earth and if he can do that with planets he can do that with you and me in the name of Jesus Christ where you stand this morning in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus.
I want to love people who are hurting more than I already love them. I want to help people who need help more than we already help them. I want to be comfortable, more comfortable with people who think about this. You know why they complained about Jesus? They complained about who he hung out with. The priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. They said he hung out with drunkards. He said he hung out with tax collectors. He was hanging out with the IRS agents. <laughs> that was their complaint. I want to love this community more than I already love it. There's an area down front. You don't have to come, but I just want you to know it's here. If you feel like maybe that you're just <laughs> dirtier and, and you just don't even know if God can get this dirt all in line. I want you to know this is open for you just to take a step of faith and say, God, I just give you my dirt. I just give you my dirt, and I'm asking you to do something miraculous. You don't have to come down front to pray that. You can pray that wherever you are. You can pray that prayer of faith. You, maybe you want to step out and say, God, I just want to love people more than I already do. I want to love those who are hurting. I want to love those who, whose lives are not together, Lord. I don't want to ever turn my nose up or turn my head away from anyone. I want to love people. I invite you to come to pray that prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, help us as a church to be a church that is pursuing your holiness. We want to passionately be like you, but we want to also make sure that our hands are always dirty. Holy hearts and dirty hands out of a passion to be like you, to live like you, to love like you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I ask you to do this for us. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.